I'm a freak, and I will always be a freak. I never knew my birth parents. They gave me up for adoption immediately after I was born because I'm deformed. When I was born, most of my upper lip was missing, as was a good portion of my nose. All I had was a vertical hole where all of that should have been. My eyes are unusually far apart as well, giving me a very unnatural, almost unhuman look. If I had been born a hundred years ago, I probably would have died during my first days of life, or perhaps I would have been murdered by the midwife who assisted with my birth. And back then, if I were lucky, I would have been sold to a circus and put on display with sideshow freaks. In those days, people were always fascinated with the weird and unusual. Heck, actually they still are. But enough about that. Like I said, I was abandoned by my parents, orphaned on the very day of my birth. I grew up in Massachusetts children foster care system. Sounds fancy. Almost formal, doesn't it? All the unwanted children like myself that are unadoptable are committed to a special orphanage. There are about a dozen of us here at any one time. Some of the kids here have birth defects, but none as severe as mine. Maybe they're born without fingers or toes, and some may be blind or deaf. Some suffer from some form of mental handicap. A few are scarred by burns and other traumas. Where we live is a small building named the Todd Browning Foster Care Facility. And in fact, it had been the state's original mental institution for many years, until they built a newer and bigger one about 20 years ago. The new one is where the state of Massachusetts sends all of its psychopaths, its criminal insanes, and its mental patients and all of its other crazies to be locked up. And it's right out our front door, about a hundred yards away. And when the light is right, we can see the patients looking out of their barred windows. It's positively frightening knowing that so many unstable people are just across the property like that. And as I said, our building is old. It's dark and drafty, and usually in some state of disrepair. Cracks in the walls and ceilings aren't uncommon, and the lighting isn't the best. The heating and air conditioning work, well, most of the time. In wintertime, cold, biting wind sometimes slips through cracks under the window sills, and ice may even form on the insides of the windows. During the spring rains, water can sometimes found be dripping somewhere in the building, and it may take a few days for the roof to be repaired. And besides all these wonderful amenities, there's something else here. Almost since our building first opened in its original capacity about 70 years ago, there's been talk of a ghost that roams the halls at night. A very few people have seen it, but everybody knows about it. And they say that the adult mental institution next door is haunted as well. And at night, I sometimes feel the cold hand over my face, but there's nothing in the room with me. Sometimes I feel like I'm paralyzed in bed. I feel it. It's real, but I just can't explain it. When I awaken the next morning, my mind is foggy and my dreams are vague. Technically, well, legally, we're wards of the state, but in actuality, we have about as many rights as the prisoners confined in the main building out front. The outside doors are always locked and we can never go outside unless we're escorted there by staff. We even have, well, you might call them guards because that's what they are. I suppose someone's afraid one of us will get away. The specific ward where we live is called, naturally, the foster care unit. Everyone who works here just calls it the F.U. F 
for foster care and you for unit. And obviously, the kids are called the FUs. And, well, I think you know what that means. And I guess we are. In some form or fashion, I suppose we're all effed up. About the only benefit of being in the site's orphanage system is that the government pays for all of my surgeries, and I've had quite a few of them. Some of them I was still a baby, and several more over the years since. For a rather simple reason, I've acquired the nickname No Face when I was younger, before my more recent surgeries. When you saw me back then, I really didn't have much of a face, so the nickname kind of fit. The doctors at the children's hospital did their best. They succeeded in constructing me a new nose. It isn't perfect, mind you, but I do have a nose now. It's somewhat misshapen and a little off-center, but at least my face no longer repulses those who look at it. However, they couldn't do much about correcting my eyes. You know, about them being so far apart. The doctors tried, twice, but neither operation worked satisfactory, so I'm still not the prettiest looking thing around here. My earliest memories are of headaches and pain, sitting by myself in a corner of the day room in the children's orphanage, crying from the misery of their horrendous headaches. And when I say headaches and pain, I don't mean a simple headache. I mean mind-numbing, seeing blinding flashes of light, God-hates-me migraines. They'd last for hours, too. Usually I'd vomit when the pain grew unbearable, then the migraine would ease. Sometimes I'd have them several days a week. This went on month to month, year after year. And I suppose I'll never know if these migraines are caused by the doctors chiseling on my skull to fix my eyes, or if they're just a byproduct of my own facial deformity. Now that I'm in my teens, my migraines have changed. Instead of vomiting when the pain grows unbearable, I see things now. Well, I sometimes see one thing. Something odd. Something... I don't know. Almost supernatural. During some migraines, I sometimes see a man made of nothing but shadow. At first, I thought my migraines were making me hallucinate, but I soon realized that he was real. I figured I was seeing the almost legendary ghost of our building. And he's always just a little bit out of focus, and he has no features. He's just a human-like shape, very dark and gray in color. He always stays in the darkest area of the building, and I've never seen him out in the areas that are brightly lit. My vision is pretty good for having two crooked eyes, and I can always see the room and everything in it very well. It's just him that I'm not able to bring into focus. And so I started calling him the Shadow Man. He, or perhaps I should call him an It, moves slowly around the ward, almost like it's floating across the floor. But its legs never move. Slowly, almost gracefully, it maneuvers through the shadows, gliding as if it's skating on ice. It's almost mesmerizing to watch. It has no features that I can discern, but I'm glad it keeps its distance, for I fear what it might look like if it gets close enough for me to get a better look. Its body will flex and bend in ways that aren't natural, as though it's made of rubber, or maybe it just doesn't have any bones. No one that I've known has seen it but me, and I've asked a few times. And then one day someone told the nurse that I said I was seeing a shadow man. She thought I'd gone crazy. She put me in the safe room and locked me in. She was following an old leftover policy from years ago, back before psychiatric patients had rights. The 
safe room is actually a closet where they temporarily place agitated patients until they calm down. And I was given only a small mattress to sit on and a bucket to use for bathroom purposes. I wasn't going to pee in a bucket. So, less than an hour later, I was yelling through the door that I was just pretending that the Shadow Man is only a make-believe story that I tell others when I'm bored. And, well, she let me out. Eventually. And I never, ever told anyone again about seeing the Shadow Man. And not long ago, another boy my age came to stay at the FU. William is his name, but we call him Billy. He was a regular kid in the foster care system, until he was badly burned in a fire. He'd been playing with matches, but he lost control of it. Billy had been released from the burn hospital in town, and is at the FU to finish his recovery. His face is almost healed, but the burns on his arms and legs have permanent scars. It makes them look like they're covered in alligator skin. Though he and I aren't really friends, we're about the same age, so we talk a lot amongst ourselves. One night, Billy whispered to me that he wanted to tell me a secret, but he said I'd have to tell him one in return. I swore I'd keep his secret and debated whether to tell him about the Shadow Man, and I told him to go first. Billy's eyes scanned the room quickly, making sure no one was listening. He said that he'd seen the ghost the night before, and his description perfectly matched my shadow man. I was shocked. I thought I was the only one who could see the shadow man. It was now my turn to tell Billy a secret. I chickened out. I just couldn't bring myself to tell him that I'd seen it too. Not after the nurse locked me in the safe room. I couldn't risk that again. I quickly made up a lie and told him that due to my face being so ugly, I told him that I like to imagine that I'm a monster, and that I pretend I hurt the people that hurt me when I was little. Billy gave me an odd look for a moment, and then laughed. We talked for a little while more, and then we went to bed. Hours later, I still couldn't go to sleep. I snuck down the hallway to the bathroom to be alone and to have some time to reflect on what Billy had told me about him seeing the Shadow Man. I sat on the floor of one of the shower stalls, wondering if I should risk telling anyone again about seeing it walk the halls at night. And it wasn't before the night janitor, Mr. Tommy, began making his cleaning rounds. He wheeled his cleaning cart into the same bathroom where I was hiding, and he set about his normal cleaning routine. He'd only just gotten started when the shadow man appeared a short distance behind him. It stretched out an arm towards him, spreading apart its fingers wide. It almost looked as though it were casting a spell on him. Mr. Tommy froze in mid-broom sweep. His body never moved. Not an inch. All expression drained from his face, and he looked, well, he looked dead. This was all too unreal. I slid back against the very back wall of the shower and tried to get out of sight. Tiny wisps of black smoke filled from Mr. Tommy's eyes and mouth, drifting back directly to the outstretched hand of the Shadow Man. More and more smoke poured from Mr. Tommy's face, and the Shadow Man absorbed it all. Mr. Tommy seemed pale. The features of his face and even his hands grew thin and bony as his life was sucked from his body. And I, I was trapped in the shower, terrified. I silently prayed that the shadow man wouldn't find me. Mr. Tommy's eyes rolled back into his head and were now just blind, unseeing white orbs in their sockets. He gagged briefly, and a whitish foam dripped from his lips. Then... Rigid as a tree trunk, he fell flat on his face on the floor. The shadow man floated over to the corner of the room and stopped right beside the shower room entrance. 
It was now only a few feet away from me. I drew my body into a tight ball, trying to make myself smaller, wanting more than anything to remain unseen. The shadow man trembled and shook. Its body seized over and over violently, but it remained totally silent. The area of its face ballooned larger with each spasm, and just when I believed its head would burst, it leaned forward and seemed to begin to retch repeatedly. It quickly regurgitated out a small, tentacled blob of a creature. And this tawny octopus-like thing thrashed and flopped madly on the floor, fighting to turn itself upright. And upon doing so, it crawled back over to the shadow man and attached itself to its leg. It had spawned. I fought the urge to scream. I now knew it would reproduce, and the thought of more of these things stalking the building was beyond imagining. It then glided from the room, fading into the shadow of nothingness, just like it always does. For the longest time, I remained in my hiding spot. Only after an hour or so did I find the courage to run back to my bedroom. I wanted so badly to stop and check on Mr. Tommy, but he was surely dead. He looked almost like a mummy, shriveled and dried up. So, the next day we were told Mr. Tommy had died from a massive heart attack while working. But I, I knew otherwise. But I kept my mouth shut. We had school teachers at the orphanage. Yes, we got an education. State law required it. Yet the one thing the teachers and staff never discussed with us was religion. I longed to question them as whether the shadow man was perhaps a ghost or a demon. Maybe he was an angel, or maybe he was the devil himself. We didn't get hugs or bedtime stories. There weren't any mommies and daddies around to tuck us in. So, we grew up fast. Many undesirable children have come through the doors over the years, though most left after a few months. I believe most of them eventually got placed in foster homes. A few got lucky and got adopted. I, on the other hand, have been here for years. Well, as long as I can remember. And over the years, I've never become friends with most of the kids who stayed here. But they've been a few who were nice to me. I've never heard from any of the kids after they left. Some say they'd write me, but nobody ever has. Last night, in the silence and darkness of midnight, I sat upright in bed, frustrated that sleep wouldn't come. The shadow man faded into existence here in the boy's bedroom ward, appearing on the far side of the room, opposite my bed. I froze. I dared not move. I wanted to slowly slide down under the covers and pretend to be asleep but I was sure it'd see me if I moved. It floated by each bed, but never stopped. It came across to my side of the room, as if looking for something. And soon, it turned to face my direction, and it seemed to realize that I was watching it. It pointed a long, black arm at me, then to itself, then back at me, as if it were asking, if I could see it. So, hesitantly, fearfully, and through tears of terror, I nodded yes. It glided over to me, its legs never moved, like a skater sliding over ice. Fear rose in me. I'd seen it many times, but now it finally seen me. I wanted to run. I wanted to scream. It stopped directly in front of me and stooped over, its face near mine. It looked me over closely and slowly, as if it had never actually seen me before. 
and up this close I could finally make out its features. It wasn't like a man, it wasn't even human. I fought back the need to cringe as it finished examining my face. It was only inches from me, and I couldn't look away from its true form. It didn't have a face, it didn't even truly have a head. What I had presumed to be its head was, in actuality, a giant lidless eyeball, shrouded in interlocking layers of reptile-like scales across the top, the sides, and the back. This massive eye was attached at the base to a neck-like mass, a mass comprised of many thick, writhing, fibrous muscles. The Shadow Man's hands, if you wish to call them that, rose on either side of my head. I wanted to close my eyes, but I couldn't. I truly believed I was too afraid to do so. Its two arms were actually two very long octopus-like tentacles, and his, well, I'll call them hands, were half a dozen smaller tentacles. Its tentacle fingers engulfed my head. They wriggled and flicked about, like long worms crawling on my skin each trying to find its own particular place on my skull. I screamed, and in that same instant, a bolt of cold energy raced from its tentacle fingers into my head and down through my body, paralyzing me totally. Horrified beyond description, I felt my thoughts being pulled from my mind. Random memories surfaced and were drawn out of me, into it like using a siphon. It was scanning my thoughts by sucking images right out of my mind. In essence, the shadow man was reading my thoughts and reliving my experiences. It quickly, almost expertly found my memories of Mr. Tommy's death. It played that memory over and over again, as if it were studying the terror I felt from the incident. It seemed to relish my terror, as if it were a pleasing taste that it savored. Its psychic examination of my memory seemed to go on forever. As I glanced around the room, I saw that nothing was moving. Not the ceiling fans, not the number of seconds on the big digital clock, not a thing was moving. And I realized that this must all be happening instantaneously, at literally the speed of thought. It soon released me from its grip and moved back slowly. Time returned to its normal flow. It remained by my side as my mind struggled to sift through what just happened, as if it were waiting to see how I would respond. Questions formed in my mind as I tried to figure out what the Shadow Man actually was. Suddenly, I realized that its hand rested on my shoulder. Its tentacle fingers crawled up the side of my face like worms crawling from a freshly dug grave. It forced images into my mind, and I fought to push them away, keep them out, but I failed. It was as if I were trying to stop a huge waterfall from flowing down over me and the images were answers to all the questions that I had. We die so they can give birth. As I saw the night Mr. Tommy's life was devoured, they can reproduce by sucking our life right out of our bodies. Their energy not matter. They can walk through walls. They can disappear from one location and reappear instantaneously in another. Darkness is the air that they breathe. Light is suffocating to them, like a person drowning in water. They survive by consuming the very memories from our minds. They can taste our thoughts. Our dreams are their nourishment. They devour them while we sleep, and that's why we never remember our dreams. They eat them. They especially love our nightmares, for those are the most delicious of all. If they eat our memories while we're awake, its victim is stricken by horrible life-crippling headaches. My mind reeled as this true explanation for all my years of pain were made clear. 
the disgusting realization of what this meant made me throw up. For years, my migraines had been caused by this thing, by it sucking my thoughts, my emotions, and my memories right out of my brain and eating them. In utter futility, I fought to scream my question that if they had a name for us, as it flooded my brain with a short series of revolting images. Its answer was, you are food.